still here. <laughs> Are you one of those people, man? I hate looking at myself. Yeah, can't stand it. Do you do the hide self view? I do that. Uh, no, I don't do it often, but I keep myself pretty small. But you're a big dude. I know it's tough. Even though it's, mm. you know, I try to make it small, it still busts out of that window sometimes. <laughs> Are we live? Are we yeah, live now? Live. Yeah, we're live. Yeah. Hey, everybody, uh, we'll get rolling here in just a couple minutes to give people time to join. Updating signal on my uh, on my phone. To do that. You should always update your applications. Thank you. I'm a security guy. Did you know? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I like long walks on the beach and bacon. And sunsets. I enjoy sunsets by the campfire. Thank you. Yeah. I also enjoy that. And bacon. I do like bacon. Sausage as well. Hmm. Oh, see, somebody seconded the bacon is delicious. All somebody right. With, somebody with some logic. <laughs> All right, cool. I guess we'll get rolling. Um, so I'm Oscar Meeks. Uh, I'm going to be hosting this new series that we're firing up here. We're pretty excited about. Uh, it's called Under the Hood, as you guys probably all know since you're here. Uh, but the goal of the these webinars is going to be to essentially go through relevant cyber threats, uh, share cyber threat intel to you, and try to make sense of things that may seem confusing sometimes. And then furthermore, we want to give you guys something tangible to take away from this. We don't want to just talk uh, and say a bunch of things that are over your head. Uh, we hope at the end of these, uh, you're going to learn something we talk about today. And uh, we're going to give you some items too to take away so that you'll be able to implement some of the things that we're talking about into your environment. So ultimate goal is to um, arm you guys with knowledge so you can lower your likelihood of having an incident. Any thoughts about that, Evan? No, no. So, you know, and for people that don't know us, I mean, Oscar, you're the director of technical services at FR Secure. I'm uh, it's, it's an honor for me to be here with you because I have a ton of respect for the things you say and how you run that. Uh, for people who don't know me, I'm the uh, CEO of FR Secure and uh, just really proud uh, to be here. So yeah, me too. It's good. Good stuff, man. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate that. So let's dig right in. we got a whole bunch of topics to go through today and be transparent with everyone. We probably aren't going to get through everything. Um, but we want to hit the critical stuff first and we will be sending out a summary. So even the topics we don't get to, uh, we'll send out notes after we wrap things up and uh, make sure you still get that information that you'll need. Uh, so the first thing we want to talk about, I'm sure it's high on everyone's mind right now is uh, COVID sucks and we're getting pwned. Uh, <laughs> recently, our friends at Arctic Wolf uh, released their annual security report. And there are a few interesting takeaways uh, that I wanted to just share with you guys today. Um, number one, um, we're seeing that 35% of all attacks are occurring between the hours of 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. Um, why are they doing that? Because we're asleep. Um, attackers typically understand that our mean time to respond is going to increase during non-peak hours. And so they like to stage their attacks and deliver those attacks during that time. Uh, their likelihood for success typically increases uh, if they stage those final payloads for non-standard hours for what we're typically used to working here in domestic businesses. We also saw a rise, and also I should preface this, um, these statistics are all based on since March. So since COVID began, what changes have we seen in the information security world? Uh, the other one that we're seeing and we're living in every day is that 64% increase uh, in ransomware and phishing attempts have been observed since March. Um, yeah, and, girl, on the, on the 35% of all attacks happening between the hours of 8 p.m. and 8 a.m., meaning op essentially overnight, that means that 65% of the attacks are happening in business hours, too. Yeah, so what we're seeing is what's typically happened during business hours are the initial um, exploits and payloads, so a lot of phishing attempts, right? So a large majority of those during business hours is folks getting phished, 
uh, inadvertently deploying those payloads and getting owned. Uh, the 35% that we're seeing overnight is typically when they're staging the ransom attack or they're okay. executing their exfil exercises. Uh, so yeah, during the day, um, you guys are still going to be getting hit heavily, uh, but the most malicious of those attacks seem to be occurring overnight. Okay. Thanks for clarifying, man. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so the next thing, like we said, a 64% increase in ransomware and phishing attempts since March. Um, it's typically pretty logical here. We see that a lot of our ransomware events, right, all originate from uh, a phishing attack. That's how an attacker is typically able to harvest the credentials they need to later go to the ransom attack or to uh, deploy their initial payload uh, on those affected devices. Uh, we know that our remote remote workforce has significantly increased this year, unexpectedly, right? And so because of that, uh, our atta attackers essentially have a much larger target pool than they've had before. Um, and so we're seeing that attackers are enumerating those users and uh, targeting them with an uh, increased pressure and focus on phishing with an ultimate goal of deploying ransom. Uh, and the big one here that's really interesting is uh, to coincide with all that increase in phishing is a 429% increase in account takeovers. Um, that's a huge number. I mean, just thinking about from where we were in January to today, we saw a 429% increase in account takeovers. That literally scares me to death. I don't know what you think about it, Evan. It's Well, it's not surprising. I mean, you have a big recipe really for this kind of success, right? You've got um, increased opportunity because people are, you know, logging in for remote, right? So a lot more work from home stuff. And you couple that with, you know, the distractions caused by COVID and not just COVID, but also the social, the social unrest things that we've dealt with this year. You talk about um, the election this year, all those things, politics um, cause us to be more distracted. And so we click more, mm -hmm. right? We move faster. We don't take the time to just think things through before we do that click. Uh, so I guess the increase, yeah, talks, that's, that's huge, but it's, it's also not surprising. I mean, we're just living in a world right now where we have to slow down a little bit and pay attention. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think it goes back to a lot of things we constantly talk about too, and how important it is to educate your users. Uh, and, you know, sharing that mentality that Evan is, you know, if you're unsure of something, your default should always be to not click that thing, to not accept uh, those uh, macros that, <laughs> that a document's trying to run. Don't do those things by default. Always verify uh, what you're seeing and what you're getting is actually what you're expecting from people. And if you aren't expecting it, don't click it. Don't open it. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, I should have mentioned too, it's our first time doing this, but this is a news segment. We're going to hit some quick news and then we'll move into the relevant IOCs and attack vectors we're seeing. Uh, the next thing I've seen that the CIS released a report this year, uh, recently in November the 30th, and identifying that RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol, continues to be one of the most attacked protocols. Um, I can say too, from our DFIR practice, that uh, we see, again, that um, if you have RDP open to the internet, it is an initial ingress point and a large number of our incidents that we work. Um, so the moral of that story here is, you know, we want to give you guys some actions around that. Obviously, um, I recommend you don't use public RDP systems. We understand that there are some business cases where people absolutely have to have that. My gut still don't do it, but if you do have to do it, uh, we put together um, some quick bullet points that we'll share with you uh, after this too and run through. But, We'll talk through them real quick too. Uh, if you have to put it out there, put it behind a, a remote desktop gateway uh, or behind a VPN and always put multi-factor on the gateway or the VPN that you're using. Uh, always update and patch your software. Uh, make sure you have all system updates for any systems that are using RDP. We're gonna talk a little more in detail a little bit later about zero logon, which I'm sure you guys have heard about by now, uh, but it's a pretty nasty uh, vulnerability within the remote desktop protocol. Um, also, if you must enable those things, lock it down by IP. Set up an approved list and permit only the IPs that should be connecting to those services to connect. Don't open them to the world. If they're open to the world, they're going to be attacked. Um, also, implement an AD group uh, for those that require RDP. 
and unique, unique credentials for those users too. So don't be using your same account that you use to do day-to-day -day activities for that remote session. Set up a unique account that only gives them access to that environment and they can use their other credential sets um, for the other business tools that they may need to use from within that connection. Uh, as always too, uh, use complex and unique passwords. Um, train your people on what a complex password is. Just because you have a group policy with complexity settings enabled, it doesn't necessarily equate to a secure password. Uh, so make sure your folks understand that uh, December 2020 exclamation point is not a secure password. It's easily guessable. Uh, also implement session lockouts for RDP accounts. So if they are being targeted for attack, those accounts will be shut down. Uh, set the default sessions for RDP to disconnect the auto RDP sessions. Um, and yeah, that's kind of the, the the quick hitters on those. We'll share that in a list as well with you guys after we're done. But Evan, anything else you want to add on that? Yeah, I think just having, you know, my recommendation is just to not have RDP exposed. I mean, if your business requires it, you know, change the business process necessary, you know, that mm -hmm. you need to, to get those things off the internet, right? We see automations all the time. And if you look at your firewall logs, if you look at IDS, if you've got it sitting outside, you're seeing the scans for 3389, right? Mm -hmm. Just having that port open makes you a target, right? Yeah. If you think about the attack sequence in the recon phase of an attack, right? You scan everything for, you know, interesting targets. What's a more interesting target than RDP, right? So having 3389 just hanging out there puts you on a list for follow-up from an attacker. Yeah. So um, yeah, turn off RDP. I mean, the three, still three and a half million publicly available RDP systems worldwide. Yep. too many that's too many targets man yeah way too many like evan said you're putting a target on your back if you have that protocol exposed find an alternate method to permit those remote employees access to the environment there are better ways yeah and one of the questions you know i saw just, that just came up is recommending obfuscating you know rdp port as an alternative uh, you, you know it'll, it'll stop the most simple of scans so if you absolutely mm -hmm. must that might be a good stop gap don't do that in lieu of these other RDP protections like multi-factor authentication, using a VPN if you can, the things that Oscar just mentioned. Um, yeah, I mean, it'll help a little bit, but security through obscurity isn't really security. You'll find it anyway. It just slows them down a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I can say too from uh, historical experience that um, it's just delaying the inevitable. The attackers are still going to find that port that you publish it to. It's going to take a little more time, uh, but we have worked multiple cases where um, RDP was exposed on a non-standard port and it was still compromised. So I wouldn't rely on that as security mechanism. See, you and I see eye to eye, Oscar. That's what makes us just fun. I like That's you, right, man. <laughs> I like you. Good dude. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So another relevant piece of news I wanted to share, and this is something that we've been seeing a lot. And this week, uh, Info Security Magazine published an article about it. Um, and, you know, it's really crazy. We were working with a client who fits this story to the T. Uh, they had actually had a ransom event um, occur two years ago. Uh, the ransom demand for that was $20,000. Fast forward to a month ago and they were ransomed again. And that ransom demand was now $670,000. Uh, so the news story is focusing on that ransom demands are they're increasing, I mean, by a lot. Um, just to put it into perspective, an average Q3 of 2018, average ransom demand was about 10,000 um, bucks. End of Q2 2020, the average ransom demand was $178,000. Uh, and so what that goes to show is our attackers are uh, they've learned this is a lucrative and profitable business, and they've learned that a lot of people have no other options than to negotiate. And so they're just, you know, putting the pins to you and uh, jacking those prices up because they know that you sometimes a lot of entities have no other options. Um, so that's why a lot of the things we talk about today, this isn't meant to be fear mongering. Uh, you should take these things into account when you're uh, looking at if you are going to expose remote desktop, if you are training your employees on how to identify phishing uh, attempts. And if you're going to train your employees on complex password creation and those things, it's all relevant. And um, yeah, it's a scary world, world out there. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's uh, 
it's the basics too, right? I mean, we've been preaching this for a long time and it, and it's not meant to be scare tactics. This is just, if you're going to drive a car, drive a car, you have to change the, yep. you know I mean? You have to maintain the tires. This is just a thing that everybody should be doing, you know, backing up that, you know, your data, securing that data, you know, air gaps aren't probably going to be good enough. Get them off the network mm-hmm. altogether if yep. you can. Yeah, that's the biggest takeaway I've been telling everyone is, um, you know, if you want to prepare for a ransom event before and you want to ensure that your business can recover, um, make sure you have backups that are offline. And nearly every ransom event that we work right now, uh, the attackers identify your backups and they destroy those backups before they begin the encryption event. Um, so I can't really stress that enough. Uh, find some means or a mechanism to back up get those things offline so they're not reachable and you will have the ability to recover uh, and you won't have to negotiate with these folks. Yeah. And the question from, you know, one of the audience members, the net gain attack this week, which was, is public now. It was in bleeping computer mm-hmm. earlier this week. Uh, we knew about it earlier. Uh, yeah. Ransomware. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, so ransom rolls on and that was the next point we we're going to talk about. Net gain was the newest one. And, uh, you know, that came public very recently. Also in the last uh, week or so, we saw Baltimore County get hit hard. Uh, city of Huntsville, Alabama got hit hard. And so point in this news blip is being, you know, they're not letting up. Uh, we actually, from our DFR practice in Q4, saw a significant uptick in ransom events uh, compared to Q2 and Q3. Um, and there's a lot to think about there as to why that happened. Uh, it's not that ransom events stopped in Q2 and Q3, but they did slow down. And we've seen them as we headed into the election times, as we head into the holidays and all those things that Evan are talking about where folks are a little more distracted. Uh, they're seeing that as an opportunity to act and um, you know, deploy those ransom events. So uh, be prepared, try to do everything you can. We have a ransomware readiness assessment that will make sure we get in your hands after this is over too. Uh, so I would suggest you guys, uh, if you have the ability, take some time to go through that. You're going to learn a lot about some things you can be doing right now to protect yourself. And I think it's important. And it's free. Yeah, it's totally free. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, straight, no strings attached. I love yeah. giving away free things because then you have no, you don't, you can't use that as an excuse. Yep. They don't have money. Exactly. You know, if you make this a priority, you get this stuff done. The, the two, I think, most common attacks that I'm seeing, now I don't work, you know, with your team, Oscar, regularly. I'm not, I, I don't even profess to be, you know, as expert as you guys on, on that, a lot of that stuff. But what I do hear on the streets is two different things that are happening more often than ever right now, ransomware and business email compromise leading to financial mm-hmm. fraud. Those are the two biggest things. Uh, I did get hit up by, you know, legal counsel. Uh, outside legal counsel to help represent uh, somebody this week on a business email compromise case, $825,000 gone. Mm-hmm. So if the, and yep. you just follow the money, right? That's where attackers are going. What's the biggest return on their investment? It's ransomware mm-hmm. and business email compromise right now, in my yep. opinion. Yeah, a thousand percent. We're seeing that, you know, a lot of the attack attacker groups are kind of shying away from exfil. They used to harvest data and resell data. You know, that was a big thing. The business has flipped now. Uh, the lucrative um, investments for them and their resources is exactly what Evan said, is to focus on the business email compromise attack chain, focus on people who are contract payers or payees, uh, be able to sit back. They lay low, they watch conversations, they understand when transactions are about to take place. And then at that point, when the transaction is initiating, they essentially inject themselves into the middle of that conversation, defer that money to a fraudulent account, and then uh, make a quick run for it. Uh, if you're not able to identify that fraud has occurred and report that to authorities within 24 hours, the chances of retrieving your your lost funds, um, you know, they get pretty small. It's, it's, a, it's a very lucrative business right now. And there's another good question from Melissa real quick before we move on about, you know, what future tool do we see to stop business email compromise? Uh, You don't need to spend any money on a tool. Mm -hmm. There are just some basic steps you can take to stop from happening. Even if the email does get compromised and you have an attacker communicating with, uh, you know, accounts payable on the other side or accounts receivable, depending on what side you're on, uh, dual control. 
-hmm. you know, for financial accounts is a great way to stop it, right? I can't make a change to a an account payee uh, without somebody else signing off on it, right? Mm -hmm. We get we just are moving so fast that you miss some of these things, some of these telltale signs. I actually have a deck that I'll make available if I if you can remind me, uh, Oscar, on some training that you can give every one of your financial people to stop these attacks, right? Really basic stuff. Yep. And free. Yeah. I'd say on top of that too, right? Um, like going back to what we just said, making sure you've got multi-factor authentication on all your email accounts, right? Um, that's a big thing. Uh, and another thing we see too, that a lot of people do is they may discover they have one compromised account. They secure that one account and they assume that that incident's resolved and they move on. Um, from experience, I can say in the majority of our incidents, if there's one compromised account in your enterprise, there's going to be multiple. And so knowing that you should do a full sweep and a full investigation of all your mailboxes, if you do have one that is compromised to identify those other ones and make sure those are properly sanitized and uh, remediated as well. Um, like Evan said, you don't need money to do this too. There's a lot of really good free tools. If you're using Office 365, which I know a large majority of our clients are today, uh, there's a large number of free tools that are available in there and a security guide that you can actually use their security guide and walk yourself through hardening that cloud environment and those email accounts. So they're going to be more secure than they are today. And there's a lot of free reports in there that you guys can just, you know, go look at. Microsoft's pretty good at identifying risky accounts and telling you before the this fraud chain happens that that account could be compromised. Pay attention to those alerts. Look at them and uh, you'll learn a lot. Uh, the biggest identifier, too, we always see in these instances, uh, there is an alert uh, within that console that's known as the impossible travel alert. And what that is, is it'll identify if someone logged into their email account from Minnesota, uh, but then they also have logged in in an unrealistic time frame that they could travel from Minnesota to the second destination from, let's say, um, China. Uh, within four hours, well, that account's certainly compromised. We can see that they're logging on from two geographically uh, disparse locations. And uh, so there's a lot of indicators in there and a lot of free tools that you guys can use to help reduce uh, the likelihood of those affecting you. Good questions. Cool. Yeah, really good questions. Uh, so kind of start moving in now to like the exploit and IOCs um, for today. And I thought this has to be high on everyone's mind uh, that we would talk about the fire eye exploit. Um, so I think we start Wait, there. There's a fire. What? There's a fire. eye exploit. <laughs> That's what I've heard. What? Tell me more. <laughs> yeah. So uh fire eye was breached. It was made public this week. Right. And we don't know a whole lot about how they were breached yet at this point. We just know that they were breached. Uh, we can say it appears as though fire eye has contracted with Microsoft as well as the FBI to help in their internal investigation. Um, but how it happened, we don't know yet. Uh, I'm assuming in the weeks to come, we'll learn more and more about that. Uh, but as of now, we don't know how. Uh, but I think what we, I would like to talk about a little bit more is the why. Uh, we do know why they were attacked, right? Um, you know, FireEye is a global information security company um, with a rather large portfolio of clients. Um, on top of that too, they've developed a, a really large set of proprietary tools uh, for offensive security. Uh, as well as defensive security. Uh, at this time, we know that those offensive security tools were harvested as part of the attack. Um, I haven't seen any records yet to indicate if or if not client records uh, were also um, exfiltrated as part of the attack, but we have to assume at this point that would likely be a goal of an attacker. I think it's important to understand why an attacker would want that. Um, as an offensive security company, um, they're essentially going to have a tre treasure trove of recon information about all of the FireEye clients that they've worked with in the past. So essentially, uh, they're going to provide an attacker uh, with all the all the recon and the enumeration that an attacker is going to go through anyway. So essentially, it makes getting from point A to point B and point C for an attacker a lot more efficient because they now have those portfolios of all those clients. And on top of that, too, they got a whole new toolbox to start working with. Um, so that's what my theory is on on why they were uh, targeted. I don't know, Evan. What do you think about it? Yeah, man. I you know I, I see a lot of people sort of jumping to a lot of conclusions, uh, and I think a lot of the stuff is speculation. 
you, you, you called it out at the beginning, you know, we don't know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we've both worked on enough breaches to know that when I assume things, you know, I, I typically get it wrong. Uh, FireEye is a, you know, a fantastic target, right? It, it, it uh, mm -hmm newsworthy there's a ton of good information that you know an attacker could have could have gotten their hands on potentially uh in national security implications FireEye does a ton of you know investigative work for you know government clients including the department of defense uh, i guess the there's a couple of things that uh you know we didn't I wonder how FireEye was notified, you know, if they actually found it with their own tools or if they were notified by a third party, you know, meaning one of the government three letter agencies right. that, Hey, your stuff, your stuff is out here. You know, like what? <laughs> uh, because the fact of the matter is, you know, you can assume some things that are probably pretty close to fact that FireEye didn't detect the intrusion, mm -hmm. right? Otherwise they would have reacted and probably stopped it. They also didn't, see or catch the exfiltration so the egress was also gapped mm -hmm. somewhere um so yeah i don't know man and, and you'd think you know a lot of these tools even though they don't you know they don't have they're not exploits of you know zero days they're you know a lot mm -hmm. of them are known cves so mm -hmm. if you have patched your stuff a lot of the cves have patches and workarounds if you're patching your stuff maintaining your stuff you probably don't have that much to worry about in terms of attacked by one of five tools. Mm -hmm. um, if this was truly nation state, there's a statement here, you know, potentially, I mean, more to the story, mm -hmm. but the good thing is, is we're going to get those answers because being the fact that it is fire, eye, it is this impactful. We're going to have Senate rings mm -hmm. to be, you know, more, um, so I think, you know, I'd caution people against speculating too much and, you know, wait to see what comes out. Uh, what I don't want people to think is, because this is, we're, a, lot, a lot of people are looking, you know, look for excuses on why not doing the secure things that they should be doing. What I don't want people to do is say, well, if this happens to FireEye, it can happen to anybody. So what's the use? Hmm. And, and the problem with that logic is that's not the game. Mm -hmm. The game is not to prevent all breaches. The game is risk management, mm -hmm. right? Breaches will happen. Mm -hmm. It's inevitable. Give it enough time. It's going to happen. FireEye is proof of that, right? Mm -hmm. doesn't matter how much money you put into this. doesn't matter how many people you have watching the door. You're still at risk, mm -hmm. right? And so I don't want people thinking that, well, you know, you know, FireEye, whatever, whatever, um, uh, you know, I think FireEye had a pretty good, you would, you would hope, you know, an incident response plan in place. Mm -hmm. They're executing on that. But yeah, so you have to ask yourself the same questions. If if FireEye can't prevent all breaches, nobody can, and we already know nobody can, that's not the game. Mm -hmm. Then what do I have in place to detect it quickly and then respond to it? So not having an incident response, knowing that breaches are inevitable, it's inexcusable. So mm -hmm. if you don't have an incident response plan, what's your excuse? Yeah, completely agree. I think it's like we always say too, it's not if, it's when. And that's an unfortunate reality uh, for any business entity right now, right? And like you said, no one is immune. Uh, but that doesn't mean we, we don't do what's right uh, because it's impossible to essentially garner immunity for a business. It's understanding your business, understanding that you do have those detection capabilities. But like you said, the most important thing is having a plan in place uh, so that when it happens, uh, you're able to respond. The last time you want to test your incident response plan is in the middle of an incident. And so these are all things that you can't be done beforehand. Right. And I want to address one of the comments that was that was made online, too, uh, by one of the attendees. Their, their initial analysis, and I'm just quoting, their initial analysis supports our conclusion that this was the work of a highly sophisticated state-sponsored attacker utilizing no, novel techniques. That's not the first time I've heard that, mm -hmm. right? A lot of times, you hear that a lot in, in our initial investigation. Yeah. This was highly sophisticated. It was an APT. There's no way we could have prevented it. And 
I don't end that yet. It could be true, but you know, I mean, I'll, I'll use the target breach as an example because that one I had so much intimate knowledge of that was supposed to be highly sophisticated, you know, attack. And it was single factor authentication on a vendor portal with a link off the homepage that landed you into an extranet that was three major revisions behind that had a link to an intranet site with admin credentials, not highly sophisticated. Mm -hmm. It, you know, a high schooler could have done that. Mm -hmm. So I don't want people to rush to too much to conclusion that this is truly a highly sophisticated attack. Maybe and mm -hmm. probably, but I wouldn't I wouldn't rule out a, a mistake at this yep. point either. Yep. Yeah, I hundred percent agree with that. I can say from our experience too, like we may see sophisticated techniques of an attacker once they're in an environment. Uh, but going back to what Evan said, when we find that level of ingress and that initial point of exploit. Greater than 90% of the time, it's a rather simple path to get a foothold in an environment. And it's something that's been overlooked, something that was missed, something that was misconfigured. Uh, and that's typically how these things all start. Now, maybe when they're inside, they have a sophisticated, you know, mechanism for delivering tools or their exploits or so on. Um, but then again, like, you know, there's a lot of different paths uh, that will lead you to the same destination. Uh, but that initial ingress point is typically because something was missed, something wasn't being watched, or something was done wrong to begin with. Right, and and it, it may very well be a highly sophisticated state-sponsored attacker. I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying it is. Mm -hmm. Would you expect if you were in the same situation? Would you, if it if it was a a simple you know oversight, would, is that would, would you put that in your press release? <laughs> Would you put that in your public facing stuff? Yeah, we, you know, yeah, probably not. Yeah. So, and FireEyes, a for profit public entity company, they have shareholders to report to. There's more, much more to the story than this, right? Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. Yeah, Ryan, I see your note there. And that is something we're going to get to is Fire I did release a GitHub. Um, so, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so, essentially, they've got. Uh, signatures that have been publicly released for all the tools that were harvested uh, for Yara, Snort, and Clam AV. Um, what that means right now is, you know, if you're using Cisco AMP, Umbrella, or Firepower, the good news is they are implementing those Clam AV signatures into those Cisco products now. Cisco actually owns Clam AV now. Uh, so you should be getting those updates into the Cisco suite. Um, if you're not, I expect other vendors will follow suit uh, eventually. Uh, but I did take some time today and I massaged those um, IOCs that FireEye did release into a more human readable and universal format. Uh, so I've got a list of all 162-ish tools uh, that were released uh, along with the MD5 hashes of those uh, that we're going to send out uh, along with the GitHub link to you guys afterwards. And uh, so what I would recommend is uh, make sure that you implement well, first, check with your vendor to see if your vendor is going to be implementing those into your security stack. Uh, if they're not, then I would manually implement those tools into your security stack. So you can be aware if attackers are using them to target your organization. I wouldn't expect we're going to see any attacks uh, today, <laughs> you know, like most of our audience here. Uh, it's going to take some time for these to materialize into the attacker's kill chain, essentially. Uh, but it's good to put those ILCs into play and uh, make sure that if you are been targeted with them, you know it, and you're going to be able to respond and, and block those things pretty quickly. So you've got an, yeah, you put together a really nice IOC list that I think all the, all the audience members will really find value in. Uh, great mm -hmm. job on that. Yeah, I appreciate it. I took a lot of what Fire I'd done and just removed some fluff. And, you know, the main thing for most of the security stacks that folks are using is if you have that MD5 hash, uh, you can put that in and be alerted or block it, you know, if you see that. So it should be rather easy for you to sort through. Uh, if you require a SHA-256 hash, um, you know, there are some ways to um, repopulate that. One thing, hopefully a lot of these are probably going to be ended up in virus total and hybrid analysis soon. Uh, so you can throw those hashes in there. If those tools are, have been populated in that suite by now, you can pull the SHA-256. Uh, but as of right now, yeah, the MD5 was what was released. So that's what we built into our list that we will be sharing with you guys. Awesome. Yeah, I would say the other big thing I would recommend to Evan, I'd like your thoughts on this is, uh, you know, if any of our folks on the call today uh, has been a FireEye client in the past, um, I would engage FireEye. And uh, I would ask uh, for, 
a conversation uh, about open disclosure and understanding if your business records or anything related to your customer profile was affected during that attack. And being a client, if it was affected, you have the right to know that you were impacted by that. And then furthermore, looking at the data that may have been impacted, because like I said before, if they harvested you know, a record of your last of a penetration test or anything else that would reveal, you know, valuable enumeration or recon data or vulnerability data about your organization that shouldn't be public. Um, you can believe that it's, you know, a high possibility that, that information may be used against you at a later time. So if you have used fire offer services and you're concerned about that, I would recommend to engage them and uh, ask for information regarding your account. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Uh, at the end of the day, if you're a FireEye customer, you are the customer, right? You can mm -hmm. ask for certain information enough to make you feel comfortable that you've got a story for whoever you have to report to, right? I mean, if you mm -hmm. have to report to a CEO or board of directors and they want to know certain things, I mean, you have to have those answers. So it, mm -hmm. it may make sense to reach out to FireEye to try to get them. Another thing that I do uh, in a when there's a major newsworthy breach is set up a, uh, it's just simple, right? It takes about two minutes to set up a Google search and alert mm -hmm. for FireEye and then put that into, you know, a separate folder in your mailbox. And once a day, just kind of peruse through what's the latest news on the FireEye breach. Cause you might meet some, you might miss something. Um, it'll be really chatty, but you know, it gives you mm -hmm. a, a quick, easy place to look at, what people are saying, maybe you can learn some more that way too. Yep. It's a great idea. Cool. So we'll move on to the next topic, uh, unless there's anything else you want to chat about on fire. Uh, no, we could talk all day about. Yeah. About fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's uh, it's unfortunate, but then it's also sort of fortunate because these are lessons that we can learn, right? There's always lessons you can learn from a breach. So I'm looking forward Certainly. to the things we learn from this to make yeah. us make us better. Certainly. Uh, so yeah, the next hit here is we're seeing APT10. Uh, they're also known as Cicada uh, has employed um, zero logon into their kill chain, and they're actively targeting that. Um, going back a little bit, um, to talking about before uh, with you know the RDP being open. If you have that open, it's possible that, that maybe uh, part of the kill chain. But for sorry, uh, further. Uh, so we're talking a little bit about that bug too and what it is. So. Zero logon is related to CV 2020-1472. Uh, Microsoft did release a patch for this in August of this year. So the patch is a couple of months old. Um, if you haven't yet patched for this, I would recommend that you, you patch immediately for it. Um, essentially, there is a vulnerability in the MSNRPC, which is the net logon remote protocol, uh, and how it handles machine authentication. Uh, and so there has been an active exploit and proof of concept developed for this. Um, so you can exploit this vulnerability and essentially authenticate it as any machine account. Uh, attackers are targeting domain controllers and we have worked uh, some cases in the past where we've seen this attack uh, be part of that kill chain. Uh, they can essentially target your domain controllers if you are vulnerable to this attack um, and harvest hashes and other relevant information about your domain. So they can use this harvest all your passwords, all your hashes, be able to get domain admin, and then further uh, continue down their path towards ransom, right? Um, we did do a really cool article about this that we recently published on the FR Secure Ambush page uh, that goes into great detail about uh, how the attack actually works. Um, there's essentially a weakness in the encryption algorithm that was uh, deployed by Microsoft as part of the process, um, shows you how the exploit works, um, and then talks about how to defend. I mean, the big thing on how to defend against this is to deploy the patch. Uh, we can say there are some other identification techniques, which we outline into this in this detailed report a little bit more. Uh, but those detection techniques, they're pretty tough. And unless you have, you know, full network monitoring on your systems all the time, so you have full packet analysis of all the traffic available, uh, the chances of you being able to identify this uh, happening are, are pretty low. Uh, so we would recommend um, that you, you make sure that patch is deployed throughout your environment. Uh, if it's not, go do that right now uh, because it gives an attacker who gets a foothold in your environment a clear path to getting 
uh, domain admin and a rather trivial exercise. Um, so further to talk about Cicada, since we know Cicada is that APT uh, that is targeting uh, this attack right now. Uh, they're a Chinese nation state from what we know, um, but they're real big on living off the land tools. And this is another thing, you know, we see, and this may go back to kind of what Evan was talking about when they say that it was a highly sophisticated <laughs> attacker. We see a lot of folks who are, you know, getting really good at abusing built-in tools uh, that exist in any Windows environment and using those built-in tools um, to be able to essentially carry out their attack. Um, so some notes I have on Cicada, and again, we'll be sharing this with you guys. Um, they love PowerShell and WMI exec, which is pretty typical for a, a lot of ransomware attackers we see right now. Uh, they are utilizing WMI exec and PowerShell for a large percentage of their kill chain. Uh, outside of that, uh, NTDS util, which is, a, these are all built in tools, uh, within the Microsoft suite, uh, AD find and cert util. Um, and the reason I tell you guys this is it is critically important um, to try to monitor for uh, erroneous activity or activity that's not normal for all of those built in services. Um, and I know that can be noisy and it can be challenging and it can be difficult to do. Um, but there are mechanisms you can put in place. Uh, the big thing is PowerShell. Um, we see a lot of PowerShell abuse in these attacks. and. PowerShell is almost certainly going to be used uh, in these attacks, even if they're using that other suite as well. Um, and so make sure you have script block logging enabled for PowerShell at the domain level. Uh, make sure you're retaining a significant amount of those PowerShell events as well. And um, if you have a scene, you have the opportunity, um, you know, build some alerts in there. Specifically, look for encoded commands. Uh, attackers typically don't like to execute their PowerShell commands in clear text. That makes them easily readable by humans. Uh, so they'll obfuscate those uh, with some sort of encoding. Um, you can, if you have script block logging enabled, you're going to catch those encoded commands. So you're going to see a log of exactly what the command was. Um, and if you set up alerting uh, to trigger, if you see an encoded command, then that's going to give you the power to know that uh, something's likely going on. I will say there are some um, legitimate business tools that will sometimes use uh powershell encoding so it's not right off the bat going to be malicious if you see it um, but by first setting up that level of blogging and monitoring for those things uh, you're going to be able to normalize uh, your environment right so identify uh, what should be executing encoded commands uh, weed that out and then if you identify anomalies uh, then you know that's likely going to be related to a malicious attacker um, all this stuff i'm talking about too we're going to be sending to you guys in notes afterwards um, we also know it's a standard technique, but we know that Cicada loves using DLL sideloading, which is essentially they're able to take a, a legitimate DLL and replace the code in that legitimate DLL with malicious code. Uh, but the DLL is named the same. And so you may look at that and see it's a legitimate DLL that the Windows operating system uses and think it's okay. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it is okay. You like to pack that with malicious code. Um, and the other two tools that we've seen, so there have, have been... Uh, a remote access tool they typically deploy. Historically, they use one called Quasar Rat. Uh, it's just an open source backdoor tool. Uh, recently, we've seen another one come into play called backdoor.hardtip. Um, seems to be a new uh, remote access tool that they've recently deployed into their toolkit. Um, the other important thing about Cicada, and this kind of goes against something I was saying before, that attackers aren't exfilling data as much as they were before, uh, but Cicada is known to um, exfil data before they execute a ransom attack. Uh, an indicator for that is typically they'll, they'll compress the files, uh, so it's easier to get those off your network, uh, and they typically compress those files uh, with a RAR archive. Um, so if you notice RAR archiving um, you know, on, your, on any of your systems, um, that would be an indicator. Another big indicator to look for for data exfil is typically going to be uh, for huge spots in your network traffic. So going back to what we said before, where they're lock, attackers are likely to exfil data, deliver those ransomware attacks between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. Uh, if you take that into account and you do have network monitoring enabled, uh, look for anomalies in the, the volume of traffic that's egressing your network during those time frames. And if you see a huge spot that you can't explain, it's probably going to warrant further investigation to determine if you do have an attacker on your network. Um, another thing that's really important, too, is when they're exfilling the data, they typically use legitimate cloud hosting services such as Google, AWS, and so on. 
so that way, when you look at the traffic, uh, you're going to see it's going to a legitimate endpoint. And so maybe you don't think that's malicious by fault, by default. Uh, but the reality is uh, attackers often abuse uh, legitimate cloud hosting service companies as part of their kill chain rather often as an attempt to essentially evade you from detecting that it is malicious. Um, I said a whole bunch real fast. I'm going to shut up and let Evan say something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, just, I, I, I got a bunch of same kind of stuff. Uh, so APT10 is from China like you said, you know, just to validate that. Uh, also known as Stone Panda, uh, Red Apollo, CVNX, Potassium, Cloudhopper, Hogfish, TA429, and Cicada. Mm -hmm. So they go by various names, this APT10. Uh, their tool set, like you said, Poison Ivy, Evil Grabber, IE Checker, Plug X, Red Leaves, Quasar, which you mentioned, Cobalt Strut, Trocolus, uh, uppercut, stone net loader. Those are all typical tools used by this group. They typically, um, according to information I have, they target healthcare, pharma, defense, aerospace, government, and MSPs. Mm -hmm. Those are their primary targets. Not to say that, you know, you can't get into their crosshairs too if you're not part of that group. Uh, you, and just to validate, you know, what you two day exfil is typically over common TCP services like RDP and HTTPS. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, blocking, you know, FTP wouldn't stop them, uh, you know, on your egress. Uh, you'd have to watch for that spike in traffic because you probably have HTTPS open. Uh, yeah. So just validating a lot of the same stuff that you say. Um, yeah, that's the information I have on APT10. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the important thing here, this is, a, you know, kind of looking at a one APT here. And it's important for folks to understand, too, that these things we're talking about, they're pretty typical with uh, most of the APTs. Uh, we're seeing that these groups are moving more and more toward living off the land techniques and abusing those uh, valid window services, right? And going more and more toward fileless malware and executing payloads that don't ever touch the disk, but it only lives in memory. And so that way they're lowering uh, your chances of detection, specifically with classic detection methods like endpoint protection and antivirus software. Uh, those are predominantly hash-based approaches and they're not very effective in identifying attackers uh, who are deploying these attack techniques. Uh, so it's, you know, pretty logical that those are going to become the most popular attack techniques uh, by our adversarial groups. And we're certainly seeing that. I mean, uh, we can say that, uh, you know, a large percentage, most, if not all, not all, but most of our ransom events, we see other APTs and other attacker groups that are using these same techniques. And so that's why it's important. We want you guys to understand that. Uh, we will be kicking this out, the list I talked through. We do have a small IOC list for Cicada with some of the known tools we talked about, the hashes with those known tools. And we also included some of the known IPs that Cicada uh, has been identified as attacking from. Uh, so we'll give those to you guys as well, uh, and hopefully you find good use out of that. Cool. I know we only got about 10 minutes left. Uh, I'll roll on. It was Patch Tuesday, last Patch Tuesday of the year. I wish I had this number written down here in front of me, but I think uh, it was a total of 1,249 CVs this year. I think that's what my memory says that Microsoft fixed. So it was a busy year. I think last year in perspective was around 900, somewhere around there, and not, a, not an exact number, but we saw a significant increase in the number of identified risks within uh, Microsoft uh, OS platforms and security suites, or software suites. Um, I bring this one up um, because Obviously, you know, a recurring theme, we always say, you know, do the basics, do the things you can, uh, patch, get yourself patched. There were nine critical CVEs this month. I don't think POCs are available for any of those critical ones yet. Uh, but just like everything else, once that goes public, I expect that we'll see proof of concept in a rather short amount of time. Um, but it's also interesting too. two other things were interesting this month. One, uh, this did include another office remote code execution. So going back to what we continue to talk about with phishing being a, a very popular choice of attack for those initial footholds, um, those footholds are able to be executed because of 
flaws like these, remote code execution. Uh, so if you're able to use that Office Suite to execute an RCE on a vulnerable end user, uh, then you're going to be able to get that persistent access to a client and then start to posture the rest of your kill chain. So these are really critical uh, to get installed. The other thing that was really interesting this month is it was reported that Microsoft quietly resolved without a patch because they host the Teams platform, a zero click vulnerability within Teams. And what that means is an attacker is able to deliver a payload to a victim, exploit it on that endpoint without the victim interacting. Um, if the victim opens Teams to read that crafted message that was delivered to them, um, they would be exploited, essentially. And it was an RCE uh, utilizing Teams. Uh, there's a security researcher known as Oscar Vajeris, who identified this and reported this to Microsoft. Um, this was one of five, though, that he reported. And that's why I wanted to make you guys aware of this. Uh, Microsoft has officially remediated one of those five that we know about. But the other four, it's unclear. And uh, so we still don't know if Microsoft has fixed those behind the scenes and not told anyone, or if the uh, Teams platform is still susceptible to these RCEs. Uh, I think it's important uh, that you guys are aware of these things as well. Um, and then if you see things on your network too, if suddenly uh, you get an odd message that may seem a little out of sorts from another user in your network, you didn't really understand what that meant, those things would be worth reporting, especially knowing that these RCEs exist right now. Uh, an attack avenue for this, knowing that Teams operates with O365 suite as well, if an attacker is able to harvest credentials, like we were talking about before, they can authenticate to O365, log into Teams and pose as me or pose as Evan and send one of these, suspect, these specially crafted messages to someone else in your organization, uh, it's a way for them to continue that attack chain, exploit more systems and uh, yeah, make progress on the kill chain. So I think it's important you guys are aware of that. If you see anything out of sorts within Teams, don't just brush it aside to Teams uh, been buggy or slow or whatever, or your own computer. Uh, if you're unsure, make sure you, you have a security professional, tell someone in your organization uh, to have a look at that and make sure that you're not actually observing uh, this being exploited in the wild. Uh, there is a GitHub uh, that has been released that uh, is an overview of these payloads as well. We're gonna give you guys a link to that as well. So go look at that and ingest it as you need, as you can, and uh, just make sure you're aware and get those patches pushed out before Christmas. Anything on that, Evan? Oh, man, I love listening to you sometimes, man. You're dead on. Good stuff. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm just putting you to sleep. I, I see like everybody's still oh, here. No. So they're either paying attention I got my, or I put them to sleep. I got my energy drink. I got my <laughs> energy drink right here. I'm not going to sleep for a while. <laughs> all right cool so we only have a few minutes and i'm not going to hit these in detail but i've got a few more quick hits this is going to be in the supplemental information that we send out to you guys and i'm going to try to hit these in less than 30 seconds each and then if we have a couple of minutes we'll take a couple questions so uh vmware released the cve uh so essentially you can get unrestricted access to the underlying machine os um on the administrative configurator within vmware uh, so two things on that, what you need to do, uh, make sure you apply the patch. VMware did, uh, did uh, submit a patch for that. Make sure your configurator port's locked down. Not everyone can get to that. Only the people that need to get to it is locked down. And make sure your configurator password is complex and properly secured. That's a password that you set up when you're first building that VM installation. And so you may have set it and forgot about it two or three years ago. Go revisit that. Make sure it's a good secure password uh, and make sure it's, it's properly stored as well. Uh, next one buzzing along was Oracle WebLogic Server Console. Uh, remote code execution vulnerability was published for that. Um, WebLogic has released a patch for that. Right now we see there's a little over 3,000 publicly available systems that are vulnerable to this still. Uh, so, you know, not 3.5 million like we talked about, uh, but there's a chance some of you guys may be vulnerable to that. I want you to be aware, apply the patch. We've got information about the CV and everything in our report we're sending out. Uh, another day, another Drupal bug. Uh, if you guys are using Drupal, you probably know this is a common occurrence, but they released two critical CVEs this month. 
uh, they were there were vulnerabilities that were in the pair archive tar library, uh, which is utilized by Drupal to handle tar files within PHP. Uh, so this vulnerability is only applicable if your Drupal configuration permits the usage of tar, tar.gz, bz2, or tlz files. Uh, so if the service isn't uh, required, make sure it's not enabled. Um, and then also they did release an out-of-band patch, so I would go apply that patch as quick as you can. Uh, and then finally, the last thing, it's probably not going to be relevant for you guys, uh, but I wanted to include this because it is such a cool exploit. Uh, there was an iPhone zero-click exploit. So as I just explained, the team's zero-click exploit, there was a similar thing that happened with iPhone. A researcher fail, found that on iOS version 13.5, uh, by abusing a vulnerability and the airdrop and Wi-Fi functionality in an iPhone, uh, you can essentially harvest data from an unsuspecting victim uh, without any sort of interaction from the user. I'll link an article on this, let you guys go watch the hack. Take 10 minutes and watch the hack. It'll blow your mind uh, that someone can be sitting in another room. I mean, just think about if you're in a public space um, and harvest data off your phone without you even having to interact in any way with them. Uh, what you should do on this is just make sure your devices are always up to date. The latest OS build, Apple has fixed this. So if you're on the latest build, you shouldn't be affected by that. Um, when you're in public, uh, don't allow your phone to auto connect to Wi-Fi networks. Uh, shut that down. That's one of the biggest risks, and we see uh, a lot of attacks are, are set up that way. And uh, yeah, it's same thing for AirDrop. If you're not using AirDrop, shut it down. Turn it on when you need it. Turn it back off. Um, watch the video. It's a lot of fun, and it'll probably uh, surprise you a bit. I think that's it. I think we got through pretty much everything. Is yeah, there... and iOS iOS fourteen point two is the latest version, so you're quite a few revisions behind if you're running thirteen point five. Mm -hmm. And I can't reiterate enough how important it is to turn off auto connect on your iPhones, uh, because the, there's authentication. If I'm an attacker and I use the same SSID name, you're going to automatically connect to me. Yep. It's such a simple attack, and it happens all the time. Don't yep. don't do it. Yep. Super simple. Happens way more than it should. Right. <laughs> so quick hits for everybody. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Evan. We're real, we have a real quick question that I saw that came uh, from the audience. It says, what's the risk level for users who click on a phishing link but do not actually enter their new credentials? Will they be potentially targeted more in the future because they access the link? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> yeah, critical risk. Uh, credential harvesting is only one of multiple techniques that are deployed by phishing. It is a very popular one, but we also see a lot of payloads are delivered just by clicking that link before you ever enter your credentials. And so there's a high likelihood that system was infected uh, with some sort of payload uh, on top of that. And yes, also the attackers know who clicks the links and who don't click the links. Uh, so there's a high chance that the that victim will continue to be targeted by that attacker if their initial payload uh, wasn't successful. Yep, I agree. Yep. So quick hitters for you guys too. We're going to send you all the notes on this. So you'll have that. Uh, we're going to see some IOC lists, lots of good links in here. If you guys continue to educate yourself too. Um, we're going to send you the ransomware readiness report, Brandon. I think we didn't talk about that. Let's make sure we get that to everyone. Um, let's send them to, we have a free uh, instant response plan template out there. That is awesome. And if you guys don't have an instant response plan, go get this, build yourself an instant response plan. If you need me to help you, I'll help you. Uh, but give it a spin on your own. It's free. Uh, and then for everybody who's on the call, if you don't have an instant response partner, we want to be your partner. We want to help you through these things. Uh, so our instant response risk registrations, typically a thousand bucks is free for you guys. And uh, Brandon will tell you how to sign up for that. I appreciate everyone's time today. I do hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed this uh, and I welcome feedback. Uh, so if you guys have topics you want to hear about, we're going to be doing these once a month. Uh, hit us up beforehand. Uh, I'll be glad to hear you know what's on your minds. If there are things we could have done better today, tell me all about it. I'd love to hear how we can make this more informative and enjoyable for all you guys. So I appreciate you coming and, and giving us an hour out of your, I know it's a busy Friday and a busy week always. So we appreciate that. Yeah, good work, man. This was fun. Yeah, Thanks, man. Thanks for coming today, Evan. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's my honor and privilege, brother. It's always good to be you. Yeah. Well, everybody have a safe weekend. Have a little fun too. Yeah. Yeah. See you guys.